So uh, hi everybody, and uh, please see you here today. Uh, I'm uh, Peter Svensson uh, from uh, Sweden, like this guy, uh, Eric, and um, I've been invited here to talk about uh, thin server architecture, about actually uh, lowering complexity and uh, having more fun while working, or at least it works so that way for me. And I'm going to bash uh, a Google product and uh, be carried out in the tar and feathers within 30 minutes or so. Um, so, keep the tomatoes ready. Um, I am uh, working for a local consultancy in Sweden called NetHouse and uh, have some international customers, uh, but most of the people working in the JavaScript scene is here, actually. So it's been a wonderful week, and I hope to get back in sometime, but that's not what I'm going to talk about, really. Uh, I'm going to see if I can get this system working. Um, I'm also a lowly uh, Goyo contrib, uh, sorry, uh, Doyo contrib, and um, I do some small things, and I uh, evangelize about Doyo, JavaScript library, and a lot of questions that people usually have when I talk about thin server architecture uh, has to do with, well, how do you solve this problem, this, and so forth. So I have some examples in how to solve common problems in Doyo. Um, and here is, of course, some theory and uh, the obligatory comic. Um, and actually, I can do this talk very, very quickly. It's all about actually putting the client on the client and uh, not having any server-side templating at all and uh, creating a classical uh, client-server environment. And uh, I'll try to give very good reason for why this is a very good idea indeed and why doing something else uh, increases a lot of complexity. Uh, this is my... Um, view of a kind of classical uh, mid-2000, 2010 uh, application that you use server-side templating. You have a lot of uh, web page building logic. Let's see if we point there. Um, inside the server. And then you have templating and a lot of complex configuration files. Maybe not a lot, but still. So you're kind of uh, having an idea about the design and the view and the client and logic and subjecting that to a lot of knives and horror movies to separate into tiny parcels, compartmentalizing it. And then you generate the client and the view from a kind of, a lot of different templates. And uh, I would uh, urge people not to do this. Uh, the reason for uh, the server-side templating and the classical uh, server-side web frameworks like uh, Tapestry, which I like very much, and the other server faces. It's not because people are evil, but because they're really, really smart, and this is the best solution to the problem that was available at that time. Um, the problems with these uh, kind of frameworks on the server side is, of course, um, that it's a poor distribution of processing. You don't utilize a client. That's kind of obvious. You uh, can... This is actually a cheap shot. I, I, was not certain if I should have this or not, but uh, this is kind of argument against classical web 1.0 applications, and nobody uses those anymore. So you, even though you um, are using a kind of uh, server-based web framework, you're still kind of packaging Ajax into the solution and shooting it out, so it kind of works, but you get the actual happening hidden from you by the framework. Uh, but this is uh, what I'm trying to aim at, the difficult programming model. And, uh, uh, you know, if you have a, a class that does two things at once, that is uh, highly coupled for some reason, and um, maybe you change some things or add some new things, and uh, you don't have a very clear purpose of that class, that's very bad. And uh, that's a little bit what happens when you kind of define the client on the server, because it isn't on the server. So you kind of define what is going to happen in the next 30 minutes, or you have a, a parcel here and a parcel there. So you kind of mix your domains. And uh, also, if you're using JavaScript and Ajax, it's kind of hidden from you, so you don't see what happens. And the ambition here is to shield the developer from complexity. And what you get is a more complexity. So you can pile complexity upon this to shield the developer from something that is actually quite easy to do. A classical client-server application, you have a protocol in the middle. And you get a lot of XML files, and you try to uh, force this kind of single uh, process model of something that is actually a client-server, and that is a problem. 
Uh, yeah, when it runs, uh, what you see is of decoded, uh, yada yada. Um, yeah, so I'm just saying the same thing all over again. Do you have any questions? Just uh, holler them out and I'll take them as you feel it. So. Um, this is also a very bad thing. You have a lot of state management on the servers. Even if you have some kind of IX code, um, maybe you have a table with a thousand items and you're showing maybe the 20th uh, view of that page out of a thousand. And the server are caching this state and little resources uh, get used and so forth. And this is not very efficient for um, when you have a lot of users on the site. Um, Offline, um, I'm a Google fanboy, so I had to have a Google fanboy t-shirt, and so did my Swedish colleague. Um, Gears is interesting, and this is actually, it's kind of an edge case, uh, not used really, really much. But when you have to use it, when a customer or a project needs to make this done, it is very, very hard to add these kind of offline capabilities if you have a monolithic kind of server-side web framework because you don't really know where to put it or you have to make some kind of weird and even more complex situation around this, which is uh, kind of straightforward when you're working with a uh, separate server or a separate client or both, actually. Um, and then comes something that always pops up in my projects, at least. Probably not uh, internal at Google as much, but uh, uh, at some point, you always get the question that we would like to export this to customer A, or we would like to integrate this with another kind of internal project to ASP or uh, yeah, so forth. Or SAP, sorry. Um, and when you have, again, this monolithic kind of idea of a web application and uh, looking at it from a single model point of view, which it isn't, uh, then you are forced maybe to reinvent the wheel and have another kind of connection into your logic. And of course, are you if you're really smart and have uh, using really good tools, really good this server frameworks that maybe are not related to the web, then you might not have to redo a lot of it, but still it's kind of a, a, a double, double whammy there. Um, I'm not very good at uh, drawing stuff, so these uh, very good pictures are from Chris Zeip of the Zeipen Foundation, uh, and now also of the OpenIX Foundation. I don't know if you've done this, it's so really, really good. And uh, this uh, is essentially what you've seen before and what I'm talking about, unless you didn't get it the first hundred times I said it. Um, that we're going from this kind of classical model where a lot of logic uh, is being uh, used in the server, to a more loose model where you automatically get an interface for exporting stuff or importing stuff. You have, of course, the security and the core business logic on the service always, but the view is on the client or the client is on the client. Yeah. It seems like you're it's not really advocating separating the business logic from the user interface generation. Yeah, I'm, I, yes. Is it necessary that that means the user interface is on the browser, or would it be you know, perfectly acceptable to have a layer that's going to generate the user interface on a server, but that actually is communicating back through a clean interface to the actual business logic? So the two pieces are, are separate, but one's not on the browser. I get it. The question was, is it, uh, uh, am I advocating if you can have the, the, a clean separation of concerns, you have a clean UI, but it is on the server, but still a very clean uh, uh, separation from the business logic. And uh, my answer to that is that I think it's still a very good, a bad idea because uh, this uh, user interface layer is still not on the user's computer, it's, it's on the server. So you are, I mean, that doesn't mean it's impossible. People are using it every day and I'm, I'm using it by myself in a lot of projects. Uh, I'm only saying, or implying, trying to argue for, that if you take away this kind of uh, server-side templating, it is clean now, but it, it, since you're mixing domains, it tends to get complex and it's easier for you to make uh, errors. So, so that's why I think it's a bad idea. Uh, yeah, uh, I had a lot of conversations. I, I wrote on my blog a couple of, uh, or a year or so ago, uh, about the end of web server frameworks, uh, part one and two, and that was not very well received at all, actually. Um, and I can understand that because it's kind of inflammatory and I kind of argue why we shouldn't do this. And the problem is that everybody in the whole world are using server-based web frameworks. So it's not the right time to say it, or maybe it was. And we had a lot of great discussions, and uh, one person called Ganesh Prasad, uh, working in Australia, and his team, had a similar, but very more, far more specific idea called SOFIA, Service Oriented Front End Architecture, uh, which is uh, like my thin server architecture, 
but very, very detailed. It's a very good read, actually, for many of my argument. Uh, but he is proposing that you're supposed to consume SOAP XML services uh, in a kind of SOA environment. And that's very specific to, to, uh, to the environment they're working in. Still a good read, though. Uh, also, uh, Justin Meyer, uh, author of, uh, one of the authors of JavaScript MVC, has a similar kind of model. And uh, Mario Valente, who is a, uh, a hard rocker, uh, working in Portugal, also uh, former CIO of the Ministry of Justice in Portugal. Not a lot of people. Um, so I just, uh, this is just not only my idea. I try to just putting it forward. I don't care if you call it thin, thick, light, yellow, or whatever server architecture, if you call it anything at all. I just want people to try, to try it out and try to use it and make it as simple as possible and not get bugged on into specific details. No matter what you do, put the client on the client and let that be that. Uh, there's a lot of products already uh, using this kind of approach in many, many years. You have a smart client, Tibco, WaveMaker, and these are actually IDEs for generating uh, web applications. And the end result of these uh, IDEs are actually a very clean UI layer who, come, who just consumes services on the server side or uh, mashups of some sort. Um, and when I, I try to boil down what I would like people to do in as few rules as possible, uh, I wrote this. And then I realized that this is actually just one rule. Put the client on the client and the four different views of it. Um, and I would, uh, why I tried to write point one is, uh, why I did write point one was that it's much, much simpler to code something in JavaScript if you know JavaScript very, very well than doing it in Java. Uh, and that's my personal experience. I'm not the best programmer in the world. But uh, having a, a dynamic language to work with is much quicker, especially for UI tasks, in my experience. So if you can uh, utilize, leverage that, it's very, very good. And then you should communicate or consume services, of course. Um, don't use server-side templating, because that's what this is all about. And uh, that uh, boils down the server to using yeah, security and business logic. Uh, obvious business logic is whatever you like, as long as it's not user interface. So I hope it's kind of... Easy to, to understand, easy to get mad at, and easy to, to use this argument back and forth. You can discuss or, or with me or whoever. And that leaves a very, very clean model, uh, which was my, my idea when I made the first uh, thing. We don't have any configuration files that will generate the user interface. We just have business logic and some kind of URLs that the client then connects back to. Maybe have backwards IAX and comment and so forth. But, uh, at least when I'm, uh, this kind of drawing is very, very simple. Of course, there can be other complexities, but uh, from this point of view, all projects I work this uh, gives uh, me much more time to play with my kids or drink some beer or whatever, uh, rather than just bashing myself over the head with a bat and trying to f force the system to do something that it can't really do. Um, so benefits. <clears throat> I also actually stolen this kind of layout from Chris Seip because he had a good blog on it. Uh, uh, it's scalable, obviously. If you put th stuff on the client, you don't have to use uh, CPU on the server, obviously. Um, um, and this is also a cheap shot to get Ajax. Of course, you get an immediate user response. Uh, but a lot of, a lot of. I, I haven't read through all frameworks, everything they do, of course. But I see examples now and then when you have some Ajax at some points, but then you kind of get this, the whole page generation again. Uh, and it's easier for yourselves to control how your application will work and look and get very smooth flow in it if you do everything just on one side of the client instead of forcing it into this kind of weird framework. Um, but the best is the organized programming model and what happens to the team uh, when we work like this. Uh, since we have explicit uh, roles of client and server, we don't need to pretend or have uh, mock-ups or proxies uh, as much. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the debugging is kind of fair. We have server debugs, logs or client debug logs in Firebug, and we don't have to have some kind of oddball routing back and forth that shows logs where they really aren't happening. And uh, that means that we can have asynchronous development. And what I mean by that is that I sit at my table, and then I generate a widget or some kind of uh, user flow or something like this, I consume a lot of data, I draw um, tables or maps or something, and I've never been to the server. I just sit all by myself and work completely asynchronously. And then I have some kind of idea of what, I need, what kind of data I need, and I, I write a local file 
with this information that I pull into my own client. And when everything works, as good as I can make it, then I go to the server guy and say, could you please give me this kind of format and, and this and that. And then we have this automatic client protocol server and forced separation. Extreme silos, wonderful. And uh, when they have a problem, they work it out. And they know if they break the protocol, it's pretty obvious that they have broken it. It's not like, oh God, how could that work? Because you see what you're doing. And on the other way around, if I break something, if I read something the wrong way or present something, that's my problem. They can go on and continue with their own projects. And that's been really, really good. Uh, yeah, client-side state management. I know which, which page on a table I'm in. I know what, if the tree is open or closed, what buttons has, should be highlighted and so forth. So the server has no state whatsoever. There's no server state at all, which makes the server very, very, very simple to use. And of course, offline applications is really simple to implement since you have a real client. Uh, and also the interoperability, which I hinted at uh, earlier, that if you have a clean RESTful interface uh, or something akin to that, you don't have to specify follow standards all the time if you don't want to. But you have a URL that can very well document that you can pull or push data to or from. Then you can just go to the guy who asked you to make kind of portability project and say him that it's just done. It takes zero hours. The security is there, everything is just, it's, no, we did it from scratch. So you get this for free if you use a clean separation of concerns. And here is the tar and feathers part. Uh, and, and Google Web Toolkit is an example. It's a wonderful solution. I really like it because it's really cool. And uh, it's an enormous amount of effort and uh, a really uh, weird idea where I got into that and similar products. Uh, and I consider it a, a wonderful solution for a problem that doesn't exist. Um, but, and it's just because it's like uh, you know, fear of flying or fear of music, book and a film, and, and fear of the client. Uh, and we, we are very free. We must be shielded from that because it's, it's, you know, it's dangerous people out there. You, you can't trust them. And uh, you do this very complex solution. And I think that the easiest thing is to just do it. Sell shoes, buy Nike or something. Uh, so, uh, why don't we want to do this on the client? And I think that the reason for people wanting to solve all the problems server-side is because they are used to working at the server, and um, uh, the last time they looked at the client was uh, around 2003 or something like that. Uh, browser incompatibilities and uh, yada, yada, et cetera, et cetera. A real horror story. And then they said, okay, we saw this server side, we had templates for it, et cetera, and then you have control over everything at just one spot. But this, this leads to, as I just uh, discussed, a lot of extra complexities that is not apparent at the time of the creation. So, so I mean, the, the, um, the reason is to make coding web apps less complex, and it were. I mean, the, the using Google Web Toolkit, Java Server Faces, Tapestry, 4 or 5, or Echo or Wicked is uh, it's really, really effective and really, really productive as compared to doing everything yourself or, or using weird uh, browser models and not knowing where stuff is. Um, and I, I try to say to people, look for the keys where they are instead of where there is light. So you get, you know, find them. That's kind of uh, silly. But anyway, uh, nowadays we have uh, client-side uh, IS frameworks who are really, really good, jQuery, Doyo, et cetera, et cetera. We wrap a lot of communication events. Uh, Doyo, as uh, everybody else, has a unified event model. You probably have that as well. So regardless of browser, you have the same kind of object and so forth. Uh, we wrap uh, 2D graphics. I think Doyo is alone in doing that. It has nothing to do with IAX at all. I just want to push it because people don't see that. It's really cool. And of course, the server class based O and so forth. So uh, a lot of the arguments uh, that were used in uh, having everything controlled in the server are not really applicable anymore. And uh, what, what happens then is that we let the uh, people that uh, code the UI does not have to be involved in some of the more complex things on the server. And it's easy to get there if you put everything on the server and have templating and so forth. And vice versa, this, the guy is sick today. You have to do this, but I don't know much JavaScript, but we, we code it up somewhere, and then you get some kind of bad hacking on the template that get pushed out to the client. Um, and if we have a clean separation of concerns, what happens then is that uh, we get ordinary files 
There's the databases or build steps or you know, stuff uh, or projects. So we do that next week when we have time too. You just have text files that you edit and that's it. And front-end developers, that's me, same thing. I have text files, JavaScript text files and some CSS and HTML snippets. And they, I just you know, use them. It's local on my local drive. No magic there. The back-end developers can finally start to do what they're supposed to be doing, solving the problem instead of kind of solving the, yeah, I know, I'm hammering, jumping on a dead horse. And, but anyway, the, then the front-end goodness, what I really, really like is asynchronous development, that we can work uh, with a kind of a simple text file again and just load it and tweak it, then mail it back and forth or put it somewhere. And we have a kind of protocol that is more or less, hopefully, uh, okay. Um, and I think that, that you understand what I'm, I'm trying to say now. I just have some kind of scenarios that, that get sillier and sillier. Uh, no. Um, and and I, I kind of angry with, uh, when you do a kind of template, uh, you know, you, when you have templating, you have to take this beautiful site uh, in HTML and CSS and, and uh, torture it into some, yeah, mad scheme. Uh, so, and you have to do this. It, it takes a lot of resources, actually. Um, and another thing, a customer uh, told me that we want to have some kind of sharding for our administrative interface, and we had to have the cool curves for dates, and uh, oh, by the way, we have to change, switch quickly between day, month, week, year, and also have the kind of component that switch this for all the charts simultaneously. Is that okay? And if you had done this on the server side, which I started out with, uh, it takes a lot of resources to generate these images, uh, or to hold the state anyway. And now with uh, Doyo as an example, I just pull in the data once, cache it, and then I massage it a bit and have different kinds of views on it, and it goes really quickly. And the server doesn't know anything because it doesn't have any state or graphics or knowledge about that. And uh, uh, th th this is a late night scenario, which I actually, I, I have uh, a friend in France who is very much, much better than me at design and uh, CSS and HTML, um, who actually had uh, some part of the application where PHP, which was generated by XSLT, which then in turn generated the client application. And uh, this was an, an extreme horror movie. I don't know why they did that, but apparently it was very good for some reason. Uh, and this is also a cheap shop because people don't work this way, shouldn't work this way. There's a lot of obvious solutions where you can use a service like Web Framework and not having to have this enormous ball of mud. But then again, there are companies where you have that. And, uh, and if you were using a client-server separation, you would have forcibly avoided a lot of these issues without actually having to go through them and think about them. Uh, so, that's the model. And then people say, okay, but shall we do all our, our client in JavaScript? That's, that's mad. And you see before, if you haven't coded a lot of JavaScript or used a lot of frameworks, you see one HTML page with 2,500 long interspersed JavaScript and on-click events and stuff like that. And again, that's not the way it works anymore, or it doesn't have to. Um, you have uh, Doyo, for instance, is one of X also, I think, the toolkits, that have a very modular uh, client model where you have a component or a clause which can contain other clauses hierarchically, and you have a special uh, page for this is the clause, this is the snippet of the HTML, and uh, you don't have to see this in the page at all whatsoever. So you can work with the widgets, and uh, they communicate to the server. Strong data model. Uh, and th this is really hard, because I, let's see some code. I mean, uh, if you haven't coded, I, I say Doyo is a good example of how to use this thin server architecture, but then I have to explain Doyo a bit. So this is a little bit, I try to do this as quick as I can, and then if you don't care, then don't ask. If you do ask, just holler, and I try to take the question. Um, if you can see this, this is a very, very simple example of how to make a very bad Doyo page. You, uh, you have a configuration, uh, you set a variable that tells Doyo to parse the page. You don't have to do this. If you have a lot of HTML, you don't want it to parse all the tags. And why would you want to do that? It's because Doyo have a kind of non-W3C standardized model, which is evil. No, it's not. I, it works quite, quite okay, but it isn't really standardized. That you use this kind of uh, property called Doyo type on any element you want, and then the parser going through the page finds this and then instantiates the kind of widget you want. And this works just as well for your own custom widgets in the same uh, namespace you have as for Doyo's own widgets. So it's very easy to plug into and do hierarchical widgets with just one div, actually. Um, 
and this is uh, due to the Doyle loader. Uh, it's not alone on this, but it's, uh, I don't think many other frameworks have this kind of loader resolving and uh, hierarchical lookup system that Doyle has for client widgets. Hello. Yeah, and if you would like to uh, utilize, leverage Doyle's uh, widget system for your own, you can just put your own folder next to those of Doyle. It looks like this when you unpack it. And then you have a kind of, this is a cool, no, not so cool, a small little widget I did called Scaffold. And we're gonna look at this uh, main JavaScript file. Uh, this is not all it is, of course. And this is a, a Doyle class, or kind of class. You declare your class, and you say, where is the template snippet for this one? And now you might be thinking, okay, you have a thousand different snippets for different widgets. That means I have a lot of accesses to the server, and the application will get small. Uh, sorry, uh, slow. But you have a build system, an offline build system in Doyle, which can compress everything into one single file, and then you can snarf it that way instead. Um, and here's this all HTML snippets, and here you have templating. I really love templating. Though you have a Django template language, as well as this very simple template language, but these are client-side templates on the client's computer, working with the client-side class. So it's very, very uh, good coupling. And you have, you know, exchange for this dollar name thing goes to the this dot name inside the class I just show you. And you have kind of feedback. Uh, and then we use that in a page, and we use just the Doyle type equals, and then you have this new widget which is created. So, kind of simple. And this is what it looks like. He just wanted to be able to very quickly put up a, a new site for a friend uh, without jumping through hoops. And then I had just one widget where I gave a lot of names and URLs, and then it built the system menu. And I also want to know when are Google going to build the space elevator? Japan is kind of beating you to it right now. You have the resources, you have the cool imagery, the space, you know, sci-fi theme. You should be doing a space elevator. Really. Um, call me, um, Wayne Don. And now it's uh, time for uh, what we were actually talking about, Na namely the thin server architecture, but uh, the DOI way. And uh, JavaScript MVC and uh, Yahoo user interface and X and a lot of other have these kind of ideas. So they have a separation of concern in a data model inside the page and an event bus. Um, Chris Zip is also involved, of course, in this, and uh, you have a widget, and it goes to a kind of store, and the store has very general kind of methods on it, and so you can start out with one store that reads local files, then swap it for another store that maybe consumes XML files or do some kind of restive work on some kind of service or something like that. And people ask me, what kind of stores do you have? What kind of stores do I get shit with? And it's a host of different stores. And I'm not going to go through everyone, but a lot of stories. I'm actually, as everybody else is, I'm writing a book about Doyo called Learning Doyo, which will be out soon, I think. A very small book. Shameless plug, but I have to say that. And here's the other stories. Um, and this is from that book, actually. I kind of stole my own material. And the most interesting store, interesting store right now is called JSON REST store, which reads and writes JSON in a very good REST interface to a kind of REST server, Ruby and Rails, or there are Java examples that ties this. And uh, we have four kind of interface, uh, four kind of um, APIs, read, write, notification, and identity. Not all kind of bags of data needs identity. Maybe you just want a store that holds a lot of things that don't, or can be overlapping. Um, and this must be very complex to use, and I, I say no, it's not. Sorry. You have, uh, you instantiate the store in the page, and then you instantiate the data grid, which is the table, sort of a table, kind of complex, and that's it. And then you get something that looks like that. And also, all kind of Doyo markup things that you see here, everything that is uh, kind of Doyo markup can be used instead programmatically. So you can just skip the markup, have a normal HTML page, and then just have a, 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 your own JavaScript loaded like jQuery does, and, and create everything programmatically. So you kind of, either way you want to do it, and this can get, get fairly messy kind of quick. So either you want your own programmatic file or you want to create your own widgets, which gets loaded. Um, and uh, here's another kind of store example. 
service door consumes read-only services, and JSON REST store is read and write to some kind of data store. That's cool. It's actually just a cool picture. I mean, I, it's evident from what I've been speaking about, but I just wanted it there. Um, so how do you use this JSON REST store? Suppose that you have a, a kind of REST service uh, on some kind of server, which are ready to use internally. Um, you have uh, either, you can uh, just go to the URL and say, here is my REST service. You can, you can configure it a bit back and forth depending on how URLs are generated by it. Um, or you can point it to a simple method description file, which is my next slide, actually, who kind of defines services, both REST services and others, and it's used in Doyu and another, a couple of other uh, things that I've forgotten right now. And then when you have the uh, service, now you create the JSON REST store, either using a target URL or a file describing how it works, and then you just get value, set value, save, and it, uh, yeah, it caches data, and you can have a timeout, you can flush it. It also has a schema uh, that you can uh, verify against the server, JSON schema, which is also a new standard coming up. And this is what an SMD uh, file looks like, and it's uh, really simple, since it's JSON. XML is a binary format, as we all know, and uh, this is not, so it's readable. Um, and here is the uh, parameters that you don't have to define if you don't want to, but if you define them according to the JSON uh, schema that I'm going to show later, uh, it will verify this is a string, this is an integer, and so forth. And the JSON schema uh, also supports references to other objects and circular references, and uh, it is definable in itself. So it's really kind of cute, it's really cool. So go, I, I recommend to check out the schema and, and uh, give information if you have some smart to say, which I haven't. Um, and this is, I just gonna end with a, an example of the schema. You have an object, a JSON object from the server, it looks like that, and uh, here's how the schema would look like. It's kind of verbose for different type of basic objects. You have an integer, you have max and min value, stuff like that. But uh, this, why I'm showing this is uh, because uh, another kind of argument against using this thing on the client and not using XML is that you don't have a schema. Oh, then we cannot be certain, et cetera, et cetera. But now you actually have a schema. And yeah, and then I have a shameless plug for something else that is actually open source. Uh, that, so a couple of people I know are making a product that is using uh, Java on the uh, back end. It's called WaveMaker, and it generates uh, using doyu 1.0, I think, and generates var files so you can just drop into Tomcat, and it's a drag and drop ID kind of thing. And this component uh, with doyu sharding integrated, I just made this, and it's not uh, really there in the product yet, but you can mail, mail me, and I'll, I'll mail it back to you. So uh, that, that's my kind of talk. Any uh, immediate questions? Hate mail, arguments? Not as such, no? Yeah. I'm just trying to think about how to exactly formalize the question. Okay. It, so it, it seems like you're advocating putting the, the client, well, it doesn't seem, you, you are advocating putting I the am. client on the client. Yes, yes. Um, and yeah, if I, if it's sort of a, a recast of my earlier question. Running through your, your argument, I see a strong case for separating the client from the server. Ah. But it wasn't immediately obvious what, uh, what the advantage is of putting the client on the client necessarily. Okay. Uh, and one of the things that I'm thinking about in particular is that you know, in the absence of something, let's say like Gears, yeah. uh, it's very difficult for one client page to talk to another client page. If there's yeah. two separate URLs, you suddenly now need to involve the server to yeah. transfer data uh, from you know, the client to the client. Yeah, um, that's true. Which means that in some sense you're always forced to put parts of the client on the server. So why not uh, as much as possible? Uh, well, you, I, I agree that uh, for certain things, if you have a specific kind of application, you have to talk between uh, pages or... Uh, uh, the, my favorite argument against thin server architecture is that you, uh, you want to... Uh, you want to bookmark the page. Right. And this is a single page application I'm talking about. So you don't just have one page. And the only solution for that is actually to have a, a kind of 
you, you can't, obviously, you have to hope that the user are smart enough to see that this is the same URL. It doesn't really change. Or there are hash marks sometimes, but it doesn't change. So you have at every page some kind of button that says bookmark this page. And then you get a kind of a bookmark URL with a kind of hash that generated for the current state of the client. And then you need the server, if you kind of pay, copy and paste that or mail that somebody who pastes it into the uh, URL or clicks on it, then the server will understand, okay, here's the, the hash to state the, the client. Then it will have to use server-side templating. Well, no, it hasn't, but, but that's a simple solution. To kind of seed the, the client inside the page with that state and get it. So it's kind of circumspect, but that's, I don't think that's putting the client on the, on the server. It's, it's, uh, it's a help, helper function, actually, for, for uh, restoring state. And the reason I think that you still shouldn't put as much of the client on the server as possible, I think I put, I stated uh, my arguments that uh, it gets much slower and it gets more complex. And it's easier that people step on their, on their toes in the project. And you have to convert HTML into template language and, uh, and, and so forth. And you can't utilize uh, leverage JavaScript. So that's it. Um, I have a question. Does anybody work with, with spidering and search and AdWords here? No? Because people, the, the, the other thing that people are telling me, okay, ah, cute, maybe for in, in tar webs, but uh, you know, um, we're having a user-centric application here. We, we're making tons of money out of Google on AdWords. And if we have a single page application and we don't have any internal routing exposed, then we, we will, will not be seen. We'll not, you know, I can't make the page one, page one or page 100 anymore. Uh, so what do we do? And I say, I have no idea. <laughs> uh, maybe you should use just server-centric then, for crying out loud. But I know that uh, Google has been uh, uh, spidering Flash. And I think that the next logical uh, step is to begin to have some kind of standard for how, how single page uh, client heavy applications are exposing the routing. So if you have maybe 20 pages, which are just piece of the same page, which you show like cards like this, it feels like an old application only quick. Uh, then it must be able to expose that in a way that is provable so you don't have one page with an elephant on it and say, I have 100,000 pages, I'm cool, with links on it. So it must be provable in some point. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm looking to you guys to solve this, if it's okay. And then we're done, I hope. So uh, thanks for coming, and uh, if you want, uh, you can mail me and ask any more questions. So that's cool. Check out Oya. Okay. Great, thanks. thanks. <laughs>